Well, good morning. It's Reverend Mike Capron from the First Presbyterian Church of Elmwood Park. Don't you just hate it when you go to a movie and find out it's a sequel? Well, this this sermon is a sequel to last week's sermon, but I'll give you enough of a recap and so it'll be okay. Um, we're in Lent. At the time I'm recording this, the traditional season of penitence, of reflection on our own sin, and reflection on Jesus' sacrifice for our sake. So we are looking at the centrality of the cross. Um, we did that last week in a sermon entitled Jesus, Death, and Human Sinfulness, Part 1. This is Part 2. Last week we used some verses from Romans, including Romans three twenty-four to 25, which state one of the basic truths of our faith. All are justified freely by grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. The really important part there is that on the cross, Jesus, God took concrete action to save and redeem humanity. We could not save ourselves. We did need and do need a savior. In the cross, we have been justified. All the penalty for our sins has been wiped away. At some point, God willing, we become aware of this great gift. That is what it means to come to faith. Our faith does not cause our salvation. Our faith means that we understand what God has already accomplished for us. And what is our response? Well, it begins with gratitude. We are grateful for this great gift and want to make our Heavenly Father proud. So we try to live the Christian life. But then something else begins to happen, something wonderful. Having already been justified, we find that we are changed, transformed, sanctified is the theological term. Our, our characters become more and more Christ-like. Our habits, old habits, old sins that once enslaved us fall away and we become better people. That is a key difference between Christians and the world. The world sees sin as a kind of freedom, and the world views Christianity as a kind of repressive bondage. Christians understand that sin is actually slavery. As Romans 6 says, we know that our old self was crucified with Christ so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. We, Christians, know that in living the Christian life, it's a life of freedom. We, be, we become more and more our true selves, who we were always meant to be. That's the recap. Now I'm going to read our first passage for today, 1 Corinthians 5, 16 to 13. Do you not know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Clean out the old yeast so that you may be a new batch, as you really are unleavened for our paschal lamb christ has been sacrificed therefore let us celebrate the festival not with the old yeast the yeast of malice and evil but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth i wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexual immoral persons not at all meaning the immoral of this world or the greedy and robbers or idolaters since you would then need to go out of the world but now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother or sister who is sexually immoral or greedy, or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or robber. Do not even eat with such a one. For what I have, what have I to do with judging those outside? Is it not those who are inside that you are to judge? God will judge those outside. Drive out the wicked person from among you. So here's a key question. If we've been justified on the cross, why is it that Christians keep on sinning? And why is it that churches are not always peaceful places? That's what Paul is tackling. His reason, frankly, the Corinthian church was kind of a mess. There were differences in the church about what teacher to follow. They had lots of choices of which Paul was only one. There was also conflict about how many, about many topics regarding how church members should live and relate to the larger society. The first verses in chapter five, which we didn't read, reveal that a church member is engaged in shocking behavior, 
a son is living with his father's wife, and I don't mean they're merely under the same roof. One can imagine a wide range of reactions in a church. Some people get up on their high horse, pointing their finger in angry judgment to condemn this young man. Others will get embarrassed, not meet this person's gaze and do their best not to talk about it. Some will wonder about the reputation of the church as this becomes known. Paul advocates a strong course of action, which he phrases in dramatic spiritual language about handing this person over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. The basic idea is that you exile this person from the church and refuse to associate with him until he changes. The hope is that he feels convicted of his sin, repents of it, and asks to come back. This seems harsh, and it probably is. Tough love, if you will. It actually is loving because by doing it in the church, the church is thereby caring more about his spiritual condition, his soul, than what he says that he wants. To use an old idiom, the church is going to call a spade a spade. This person committing this heinous sin may have the freedom to have sex with whoever he wants, but the church also has the freedom to expel him from the church. The purpose is not to make this person feel bad or to boost the egos of church members by being holier than thou. The purpose is to help this person by showing the way he's harming himself and possibly others as well. Suppose someone you know is smoking a pack a day. Suppose someone you know is having unprotected sex in a zone with lots of HIV around. Suppose someone you know is showing up drunk for work. Suppose someone you know is cashing in their life savings to send to someone from Thailand they met online. You would probably tell them they should not do those things. I suppose, in a sense, you feel superior to them, but your motive for speaking is not to feel superior. Your motive is to help them to suggest that they should not do such a thing, that it is bad for them. Perhaps they will listen to you right away and change course. Good, what a relief. But it is more likely they will come back to you with one of two responses. First, they might say, I don't have a problem. I have anyone in control. It's okay to show up drunk for work. I can still do my job and I haven't had any traffic accidents during my commute. The other thing they might say is that, I know I have a problem, but I can't stop. Remember what Paul said about sin being something we are slaves of? So you may decide that you do not want to enable this person, that you can't be complicit in their destruction. You also don't want them to influence other people, especially your children. Mom, can I have a beer before work? So-and-so has one all the time. No, I love you, and you cannot have one. It would be bad for you. Sometimes you express love that way. I think that we are starting to see why Paul suggests that this person sleeping with his father's wife be barred from the church. When you tolerate something like that, it is like yeast. It spreads. It changes the character of the good flower that it encounters. Individuals, churches, and families have to set some boundaries about what they will tolerate and what they won't. On the other hand, this boundary setting is fraught, easily misunderstood. It's also fertile ground for spiritual pride which is just as dangerous. This is all very tricky stuff, very fraught. All of you who've ever been ordained as a Presbyterian deacon or elder, like myself, has made a promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church. I've always thought that was our hardest ordination vow because those things don't always play well together. Sometimes purity makes it hard to have unity and peace can seem elusive. But remember that this vow only applies inside the church. Christians in Paul's time lived in a pagan culture. Pagans did all kinds of things Christians did not approve of. But Christians didn't criticize people outside the church about those behaviors in this pre-Constantinian era. Today, we are pretty close to living in a pagan culture too, or at least a non-Christian one. Paul gives some good advice. What have I to do with judging those outside the church? Is it not those inside that we are to judge? God will judge those outside. Leave it to God. 
To wrap this up, I'm going to read our second passage from 1 Corinthians 6, 9-20 and offer a few comments as I go. Verse 9. Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, male prostitutes, sodomites, thieves, the greedy, drunkards, revilers, robbers, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. This is one of many places that Paul uses lists. The purpose of the list is not to be comprehensive, but to point to something beyond itself. If I make a list of crimes but refuse to include cybercrime, that doesn't mean I think cybercrime is okay. The subject is crime, and that's what I'm trying to talk about by giving examples. Paul's subject here is sin and the way it is destructive to both the person and the community. This is one of those cases where you should look at the forest more than the trees. Verse 11. And this is what some of you used to be, some of those things from the list. But you were washed, and you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. Why would you want to go backward? That's the basic thing here. Why would you want to go back to those things that enslaved you? Don't do it. Verse 12. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial for me. All things are lawful for me. I have the right to do anything. But I don't want to be dominated or enslaved by anything. He's got this weird verse here. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. It's a reference to some stuff that was happening at the time. He continues. The body is not meant for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord, bringing Jesus back from the dead. And that same God will also raise us by his power. Now, in this next section I'm about to read, listen for the emphasis on relationships and on how we are all connected to each other in the church. Verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said, the two shall be one flesh. But anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Therefore, shun fornication. Every sin that the person commits is outside the body, but the fornicator sins against the body itself. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. You were bought with a price. A price paid on a cross. Never forget that. Try to be worthy of that price, of that gift. We could never have saved ourselves, but in God's mercy, we have been saved. Together, as part of Christ's church, we may advance in the Christian life, finding more freedom and more love and more grace. So no backsliding. Why would you want to do that? No backsliding. Be faithful to Christ. Enjoy Christ. Be a church that Christ is proud of. That's it for today. Amen.